death dives from the midnight skies. <laughs> that, dreary ones, happens to be the tagline for tonight's motion picture. You smell the sweet scent of death in the air. Do your nostrils perk at its odor? Dare you behold the unmitigated terror which awaits you this night? <laughs> oh good, I was hoping you'd say that. Tonight, dreary ones, I curse you with the shilling shocker known as the Devil Bat. It was made in 1940 and stars horror legend Bela Lugosi as friendly scientist Dr. Paul Carruthers, who happens to have a thing for bats. <laughs> Apparently, so does our good friend and super dreary one, Gil Softcheck, who's requested this film far more often than it's ever been requested before. <laughs> but before we get to the movie, Gil, can you endure this animated trial? Can you stand it? Can you survive it? Can you make it to the end of this cartoon? <laughs> we shall see. Once upon a time, long ago, there was a poor, tired woodcutter who lived near the edge of a great forest. He had two children, a boy who was named Hansel and a little girl named Gretel. Although there was very little in the house to eat, Hansel and Gretel were happy children for well, they were busy each day, keeping their father's house orderly and clean. Often all the food he could bring home for their supper was a little stale bread and a half pitcher of milk. He was so worried as it was barely enough to keep his children from starving. to become of us, cried the poor woodcutter, our last bit of food gone. Hansel knew that Gretel had not intended to break the pitcher nor spill the milk and tried to comfort her. But he knew too how worried his father was and wanted to help him in some way. With a half loaf of stale bread under his arm, he took Gretel to the front porch where he wanted to tell her about his plan to get food for their supper. We shall go into the forest and fill our basket with nice ripe berries, said Hansel. But Gretel was afraid. She thought they might get lost without their father. Hansel finally persuaded her to follow him, and the two children set out on their journey through the wood. Finally, Hansel began to break off pieces of bread and drop them along the path. See, Gretel, said Hansel, when our basket is filled with berries, we shall follow the trail of breadcrumbs back to our house. 
forest searching for berries. It was getting late and their basket was still empty. Gretel wanted to start for home, but when they looked for the breadcrumbs, they were gone. In the morning, we shall find our way home, somehow. Hansel and Gretel did not see the ugly green witch, but she saw them. Every living thing in the forest was afraid of the old witch, as it was said that she possessed strange magic powers. beautiful gingerbread house it was for two hungry children to find in the lonesome forest. Hansel thought it strange that they hadn't noticed it before. The roof was made of ginger snaps, the chimney of blocks of taffy candy, and the sides were covered with frosted cookies. They were just about to eat the candy windowsill when they heard a voice say, Nibble, nibble, little mouse, who is nibbling at my house? You poor hungry children, the old woman said in a very cheerful voice. I'm so glad you like my gingerbread house. Then she said in a more kindly voice than before, come in, come inside, and I will give you something very nice to eat. Though the old witch was ugly and her face wrinkled and green, she spoke so pleasantly that the children trusted her. Hansel and Gretel were so very hungry, and there before them was a feast good enough for a king. The witch's table was spread with candies, puddings, sodas, and ice cream, many more wonderful things than they had ever had at home. seized Hansel by the collar and jerked him out of his chair. And before he knew it, he found himself locked in a golden cage. Then she said to poor little Gretel, Now you, child, put more wood on the fire. Go do as I say. We are going to bake gingerbread today. very frightened, for she now understood what the old witch was planning to do. Poor Hansel was going to be baked into a gingerbread boy. Now, child, test the oven and see if it is hot enough, said the old witch. Gretel pretended not to know how to test the oven. Oh, you stupid girl, said the angry old witch. I will do it myself. Gretel thought of poor Hansel locked in the cage, and she knew what she must do. was destroyed, the enchantment of the gingerbread house was broken, 
and Hansel and Gretel were free. Because of Gretel's brave deed, the entire forest was now free of the witch's evil spell. The animals sent a quick-footed white rabbit to tell Hansel and Gretel how happy and how grateful they were, and to show them where the old witch had hidden her treasure chest of gold and silver and precious jewels. for his lost children and had almost given up hope when he found their basket. What a happy little family they were to be all together again. Now, with the wonderful treasure chest full of gold and jewels, they need never go hungry again. And they lived happily ever after. That was interesting, wasn't it? <coughs> Ooh, guess what? It's Karoo's birthday today. <laughs> Don't tell him, but I mix him up a very special cologne for his birthday. I hesitate to call it aftershave because if Karoo were to shave, there would be no after. It would just go on and on and on, much like my introduction to tonight's film. <laughs> uh, anyway, I call this Moonlight Stench. It's a very potent concoction I have made. I hope he likes it as much as I know you'll love to hate to love tonight's film, 1940s, The Devil Bat. Watch it.
theory of glandular stimulation through electrical impulses was correct. A few days ago, you were as small as your companion. And now look at you. Hello. This is Dr. Carruthers speaking. Yeah, this is Heath. Yeah, Henry Moore and I are having a little get-together at my home tonight. We want you to come. Why, that's nice of you, and I appreciate it. But I'm very busy working on a formula for a new shaving lotion. Oh, but Doc, this is my daughter's idea. And she's going to be awfully disappointed if you don't show up. Don't take no for an answer. Make him come. Yeah, you see, it's a sort of a, a special occasion. I bet Mary is going to announce her engagement to that young rascal, Don Morton. Tell her I'll be there. Goodbye. Well, it's all arranged. He's coming. He's going to be surprised when he finds a special occasion that's to present him with this bonus check. $5,000.
you have not forgotten. You hate this strange oriental fragrance even while you sleep. Just as you did before I made you big and strong. <laughs> now, if you detect the fragrance in the night, then you're fully awake. <coughs> you will strike. Yes, you will strike to kill. Well, Doc's late. Wonder if he's been called out on a case. Perhaps I'd better phone him. Now remember, Roy, Tommy, you're not to mention anything about this bonus for the Doc until after your father has presented it. Have you warned those two lovebirds over there? Perhaps I'd better. I want to caution both of you. Not to say a word about the check. Until you're ready to spring it on him. Your father will make the presentation, Mary. Why don't you unveil it, like a statue? Then we could all be in on this. You know, I think it'd be a better <laughs> idea to put it in a bottle and uh, launch him with it. You must have gotten that idea out of a bottle. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, the doc isn't coming. What? Oh, what a shame. Oh, he just got busy with his new formula and forgot all about us. He'd forget the formula if he knew about that $5,000 check. Well, why don't we all go up there and give it to him? No, no, I wouldn't do that. He doesn't like visits when he's experimenting. Well, Roy could take the check up to him. That's... Sure, I'll take it. Shall I make the doc a speech when I give it to him? <laughs> you won't have to, Roy. The check speaks for itself. Yeah, and says a mouthful. Son, tell the doc we're awfully sorry he can't be with us. But of course, we understand how busy he is. All right. Oh, poor Dr. Carruthers. Incidentally, with Bella's accent, couldn't they have come up with a better last name than Carruthers? I mean, come on, what, are you kidding me here with that? Oh, yeah, that would have been a lot better, Guru. <laughs> By the way, Guru, happy birthday! <laughs> yes, I mixed you up this very special bottle of Moonlight Sedge Cologne. Here you go. <laughs> rank room. No, rank you. <laughs> Before you try it on, let's get to some of the wonderful things the dreary ones have sent us, eh? <laughs> First of all, John and Laura Latour sent us this delightful picture of baby Henry Latour in his shilling shockers outfit. Henry. Yes, you're going to be the envy of all the other spooky babies, I tell you, Henry. And let's move on now to these photos from Monsterfest in Chesapeake, Virginia. We were down there this uh, October and we had a wonderful time meeting all kinds of spectacular people. How exciting was that? <laughs> and last but not least, Guru, this drawing, which was sent in to us by Prince Lucian Krebsley. Lucian Krebsley? Yes, Lucian Krebsley. And he drew, look at that. He took some artistic liberties with me Ooh. there. I don't know if I'd wear that outfit in public. <laughs> but I've worn worse things, believe me. But that's a very nice outfit and a very nice drawing. Thank you very much, Lucian sending that in and you can send us your artwork really ones you can send it to this address here yes but you can also send it to the email send that in wonderful and guru why don't you try your cologne no 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 rub it on the tender part of your neck Yes, I forgot that the attic was infested with Coroptera. Coroptera? Bats. Oh dear. Apparently they're they're attracted to your they're attracted to your moonlight stench. My moonlight stench? Yes. Now you foolish werewolf. I mean the cologne. Oh, my werewolf! Oh, I knew I shouldn't have put those bat pheromones in there. Oh, that's problematic. Anyway, let's get back to the devil bat. <laughs> Just a minute, Roy, and I'll be with you. That's it, all right. Now, what can I do for you? We were all sorry you couldn't be there tonight. Yes, yes, but you see, I'm busy. Something important, very important. 
Yes, of course. Mr. Morton and Dad had planned a little surprise for you. A surprise? It's in here. Well, let's see what it is. Five thousand dollars. What's this for? Just a little token of the firm's appreciation. Oh, I see. A bonus. Well, it's awfully nice of you, Father and Mr. Morton. I will thank them personally tomorrow. I'll tell them, Doctor. Well, aren't you curious about my new formula? Yes, of course, only I didn't want to be inquisitive. What is it? A new shaving lotion. Smell it. Pretty strong, isn't it? No, no. The scent evaporates a short time after you've used it. Try a few drops. Now rub it on the tender part of your neck. Soothing, isn't it? Yes. When will it be ready for the market? Oh, it's still in the experimental stage. I want to try it out on several people first and see if it works. Well, if you'd like to send me a bottle, I'll be glad to try it for you. Thanks. Good night, Doctor. Goodbye, Roy. Lovely check, isn't it, Doctor? They are wealthy because of you. You made them rich, Doctor. It was your formula. Tonight, they gave you $5,000 and wanted you to come down to their house and thank them for it. That was your money they gave you, like a bone tossed to a faithful dog. <laughs> You should be very grateful, Doctor. Very grateful. They are rich and happy, thanks to you. And what have you got, Doctor? Tonight you have work to do. You were on your way. Tonight's a good time, while our families are here, to announce our engagement. Look, Don, I've loved you a long time, ever since we were kids. But I'm afraid it's been more like a sister. Well, I... I had no idea you felt that way. Call Dr. Crothers. Oh, please hurry. There's nothing I can do. You mean he's dead? Yes, I better call the coroner. You think it's murder? I don't know. I never saw anything like it before. The juggler vein is severed.
Send Johnny Layton in here. Well, uh, what have I done now? Who, uh, who wants me fired this time? Nobody yet, but it's still early. This came in from Heathville. It's a mystery killing. Old Martin Heath's son. Who's Martin Heath? Who's Martin Heath? Say, have you ever had a date with a girl? A girl? Oh, yes, a girl. I believe I did take a girl out once. Well, did she smell sweet? Uh, did... Of course she smells sweet. Most girls do. Well, that's because of Martin Heath Cosmetics Limited. They make all that goo that the women put on their faces so they won't have to wash them with soap and water. Hmm, I get it. A big man, huh? Yes, and a big advertising account. Grab yourself a photographer and get along over there to Heathville. The coroner's holding an inquest. Find out who really killed old man Heath's son. Okay, McGetty, I'm on my way. Uh. Chief Wilkins? Yeah. I'm Johnny Layton of the Chicago Register. Glad to see you. And this is my cameraman, One Shot McGuire. Hi, Chief. Howdy. Say, we're down here to cover that Heath murder, but we uh, didn't get much information at the coroner's inquest. I uh, thought maybe you might be able to help us. Well, I'm always glad to cooperate with the newspapers, providing they cooperate with me. That's the policy of our paper. Well, to tell you the truth, I haven't got very far with this thing myself. Oh, here's something that might interest you. It's a picture of the victim's wound. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to see it better with this glass. Are these scratches on the neck and shoulders? Yes, but uh, we can't determine the source. They're too deep for fingernails, too shallow to have been made by a knife. They're more like claws. That sort of bears out Dr. Crothers' theory at the inquest of a wild animal. Have there been any circuses around here lately? No. Heard of any animal escaping from a zoo? No. Couldn't have been one of those African leopard men. They use steel claws. This isn't Africa. Okay, Chief, I was just trying to help. Chief, are you uh, sure there's no clue you're holding back while investigating? Well, since you're going to work with me on this case, there is a clue, and a very weird one. The autopsy surgeon says that such wounds could have been made by the beak and talons of a bird. A bird? Why, there aren't any birds around here big enough to attack a man. How about an eagle? We know it wasn't a bird. How do you know that? Because we found several hairs on the shoulder of Heath's coat. Ah, chauchet la femme. They're not human hairs. What kind are they? Well, it may sound silly, but the laboratory test shows that they were from a mouse. Well, who ever heard of a mouse big enough to kill a man? Say, a bat has hair like a mouse. Well, the only bats around here are no bigger than sparrows. There was a peculiar odor about the wounds, but they were so faint and elusive that the police chemists have been unable to identify it. Then it does give us something to work on. Well, if the scent was a clue, it's been destroyed by evaporation. Say, uh, Chief, do you uh, mind if I do a little sleuthing around on my own account? Certainly not. Go ahead. If I can help you any, why... Uh... You can. Miss Heath seems to be the nearest to an eyewitness of the crime. I'd like to have a talk with her. Can you arrange it? I think I can. Well, Dr. Crothers refused to let her speak to us. We tried that this morning at the inquest. Well, don't you worry about Dr. Crothers. He's one of the finest men in Heathville. He just thought you'd add to Mary's grief so you could get sensational newspaper stories. I'll arrange an interview. Thanks, Chief. I'll uh, keep in touch with you. All right. Uh, 48J. Miss Heath, did your brother have any enemies that you know of? Why, no. Everybody in the village liked Roy. Mm hmm Well, what did he do at the factory? He had charge of the experimental department where the new products are developed. Oh, here comes Dr. Crothers. Hello, Doctor. Hello, Maddie. I took a shortcut from my laboratory through the garden hedge. You met Dr. Crothers at the inquest this morning. Yes. Uh, Mr. Layton, I hope you'll forgive me if I seemed a little abrupt. But I'm fond of Mary. And considering the ordeal she already went through, I wanted to protect her from dwelling too much on the tragedy. Of course. You were quite right. Uh, we're working on the case for the police now. Yes, I understand. Chief Wilkins phoned me. And if I can be of any assistance, just call on me. Thanks. 
Won't you sit down? Shall I serve Mademoiselle? No, Maxine, I'll do it. You may go now. Oui, Mademoiselle. You take sugar, Mr. McGuire? Huh? Oh, oh no, ma'am, never. In fact, I don't even take tea. If you'll just deal me out, I'll take a look around. I may dig up a clue. <laughs> What do you think of Dr. Crothers' theory about a wild animal, Mr. Layton? Well, frankly, I don't think much of it. I can't say that I blame you. But I, as a scientist, take many things into consideration a layman might overlook. For instance? The jagged nature of the wound, the rapidity with which the murderer escaped, the scratches from talons or claws. But when an animal attacks a human, there's bound to be a lot of noise. You heard Miss Heath testify there was no sound of a struggle. No, oh, only those awful screams. It's very puzzling, very mystifying. Doctor, when you last saw Roy, did he seem worried or nervous or moody? No, not at all. On the contrary, he was in the best of spirits. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got to get back to the village now and follow my story. You'll excuse me? If you find it necessary for us to talk again, you may come back at any time. This evening, if it's all right with you. I'd like to spend some time here. Why, yes, that'll be quite all right. Thank you. Goodbye, Miss Heath. Goodbye. Goodbye, Doctor. Uh, a little more chiffon, baby. I do not understand. Oh, you know what I mean. A little more of your stocking. Uh -huh. Like these? Sure, I like them. Who wouldn't? Now, hold nice and still, because this is going to take a little time. Well, if you're gonna shoot, shoot. Uh, uh, right away, Johnny. I, I was just trying to get the focus. Mm hmm I got it. And not bad, either. I'll be back in a minute, Frenchie. And don't worry none about those werewolves, because nothing's gonna harm you while I'm around here. <laughs> you make Maxine feel so calm. My big, brave journalist. <laughs> This is my idea of nothing at all. Sitting here waiting for an animal to give us an argument. Look at that moon. Mm. And I had a date with Frenchie. Oh, stop crabbing. We're supposed to solve a murder. You, uh... Beep, you brave journalist. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I've ever been invited anywhere and asked not to shave until after I get there. I wanted to observe your exact reaction when you tried the lotion. Oh, now I understand. I want this lotion to be perfect before turning it over to you to be marketed. Here. It's a little strong. That'll make the customers think they're getting their money's worth. Oh, that feels great. Very soothing. I don't think you ever use anything else. Well, we wouldn't want to market anything we wouldn't use ourselves. Mm, that almost smells good enough to be used as a cologne. Oh, what's the matter, Doc? Can't you stand your own lotion? I have a violent dislike for perfumes. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, Tommy. Good night, Doc. Goodbye, Tommy. What are you doing out here, Miss Heath? I thought you might want some company. Shall we sit down? 
You know, uh, you shouldn't be wandering around the garden at night after what's happened. Neither should you. Well, but it's part of my job. Mine too. Roy was my brother. Be careful, I think it's Tommy. Hello, Tommy. Hello, everybody. Hello, Hello Tommy. Tommy. What's up, sis? Mr. Layton wanted to stay in the garden for a while, so I joined him. Don't tell me you're waiting for that animal Dr. Carruthers mentioned. So you don't believe it either? I certainly do not. It's ridiculous. But somebody or something killed your brother. And I suppose you're working on the theory that the murderer always returns to the scene of the crime. Perhaps I am. Well, not for me. If you'll take my advice, Mary, you'll leave these gentlemen to their vigil and go to bed. That's what I'm going to do. Good night. Good night, Tommy. I uh, don't think your brother likes my being here. Oh, you mustn't mind, Tommy. We're all terribly upset. I know. I'm telling you, McGetty, it was a bat. I saw it kill Tommy Heath. Listen, Johnny, I want you and One Shot to come on home or I'll fire both of you. I'm not coming home and neither is One Shot. I'm keeping him here to get a picture of the devil bat. Say, that'll look great in the headlines. Devil bat strikes again. Listen, don't tell me it had horns. Maybe I better send the wagon with the steel bars and the strong boys with the straight jackets. Look, Joe, have I ever lied to you? Plenty of times. Well, I'm not lying this time. If it ever got out that I cooked up a fake story about a devil bat, I wouldn't be able to get a job on a country weekly. Print the story, Joe. So help me, it's on the level. All right, I'll print it. But I won't believe it. Not till one shot gets me a picture of that devil bat in action. Don't worry, he'll get it. Goodbye. You, my friend, are going to get a shot of the devil bat in action. Who, me? How? Have you uh, noticed there's a taxidermist shop in the village? Well, you wouldn't suggest that I go out and stuff a bird, would you? One shot. To think that you would even hint that I would suggest you have the village taxidermist build you a nice big bat for pictorial purposes. Besides, a bat isn't a bird, it's a mammal. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? Where is this bird stuff in the Emporium? Oh, down on Cottage Grove Avenue. <laughs> Dear, poor Guru. Because of my cologne, Guru is now the victim of assault and battery. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Don't worry, Guru. I got an idea. I got some idea. It's gonna take care of business here. An eye for an eye, right? Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get, you flying rat. Anyway. <laughs> yes. Well, it's a temporary solution, I'm afraid. I can mix up an antidote here. <laughs> I've got belladonna, aconite. And uh, Virginia Dare pineapple soda. That'll do the trick here, I think. Uh, oh. All right, try some of that off. Try some of that off. Let's see what happens. Oh, uh, it made things worse, I think. Oh, dear. Oh, well, this is a good time to get to your mail. Yes. Wonderful. The rule. It's the dread letterbox time, man. All right, here it is. This one comes from Daniel Parziale in Salem, Mass. I should have known that because it's written in Transitus Fluvii here. Yeah. Congratulations, Penny Guru and Dr. Manford for one of the best horror sci-fi movie shows since Mystery Science Theater 3000. Isn't that nice? Wonderful stuff. I caught the recent show about the old school horror host in the Boston area and have an FYI for you about Cecil. Cecil's program aired on 56 and he was a huge rotating eyeball that hovered in the netherworld of smoke. He had a very patronizing attitude and lacked two things you have. You are rude. No, I'm just kidding. It says uh, cool sidekicks like Guru and Dr. Manfred. Get your mind out of the gutter. Well, hey, you know what? That's the way it is. 
Anyway, keep up the exquisite work. And if you're ever flying over Salem, stop in for a spell. <laughs> wow, are we related or what? Your dreary one, Daniel Carziali, Salem, Mass. P.S. Could you possibly send an autographed picture of you and the guys, please? You betcha it's on the way, Daniel. Thank you for your very nice letter. And now it's time to get back to the devil band. Right, run around the room. <laughs> no. Are you suggesting that I deprive the dreary ones of their doom, of their curse? I am here to dispense with the forbidden and mysterious imagery. Shall I deprive them? <laughs> I'm afraid not. <laughs> time to get back to the devil band. Ow, I think it bit me. <laughs> you little stinker. <laughs> Here's the idea, Frenchie. You hang on to the bat till I get my camera set up. And when I raise my hand, you give the bat a good shove, and it'll swing out just like it's flying. Then I can get a swell picture from a boss. Get it? Oui. I am wise, no? No. But hang on to the bat until I raise my hand, huh? Say, what's the idea of breaking up my devil bat? I'm gonna make you pay for that. And I'm going to take you to jail until you explain this. Come on. You, you can't do this to I'm me. I'm doing it. I was just conducting a little experiment, trying to find out how the devil bat does his killing. I'm uh, sure McGuire didn't intend doing anything wrong. He's uh, just a little overzealous about his work. Well, with the town in an uproar, and everybody terror-stricken, wondering whether he's going to be the next victim, I don't want any more trouble stirred up. Even with an artificial bat. You'd uh, better get back to the hotel. I want to talk to the chief alone. Is it all right, chief? Yeah, but be careful in the future. Ever smelled anything like this before? Well, yes. That's the same stuff that's been on every one of the devil bat's victims. Where'd you get it? Found it in Don Morton's bathroom. Find out where Morton got it? No, I didn't want to arouse suspicion by asking questions till after it's been analyzed. You think it has any connection with the murders? That's the way it strikes me, but I, uh, I can't figure out how. Well, I'll get the police cameras on it right away. I'll snoop around and see if I can find out where Morton got it. Well, it probably came from down at the Heath Cosmetic plant. I have men working on the theory of a disgruntled factory employee committing the crimes. It's certainly more than coincidental that all the victims have been members of the Heath and Morton families. Yeah. Looks like a plot to wipe them all out. I uh, wish the rest of them would leave town until this crime is solved. You're worried about Mary, aren't you? Well, yes. I've been urging her to leave, but she won't go without her father. And he insists on remaining here to help clear up the crime. And worse than that, neither Heath nor Morton will let me give them a bodyguard. I guess we'll just have to wait for something to break. Good night, Chief. Good night, Johnny. Boy, 
if I got a picture, it'll knock my ginty dead. Meet the double bat. Well, how about that wire? Looks as if the bat's on a flying trapeze. Oh, but I'm not through working on it yet. See, I can touch this picture up so the bat'll look like he's got nothing around him, but nothing. <laughs> okay, Rembrandt, you win. This is your news commentator, Walter King. Tonight, we're broadcasting from the little village of Heathville, where an alleged devil bat has claimed three victims during the past six weeks. You will note that I say alleged devil bat. That, ladies and gentlemen, is because your correspondent has been very skeptical from the start as to the existence of this horrendous creature. I have as my guest in the studio tonight, Professor Percival Garland Rains, perhaps the world's greatest authority on animal life. I'm going to interview Professor Rains on the subject of the devil bat. Our radio audience may draw its own conclusions. Professor Raines, first let me ask you, point blank, do you believe that any such creature as the devil bat exists? I do not. He's got a nerve. Quiet. In the dark ages, when men and women lived in caves, there may have existed a bat of this size, but not in this day and age. How do you account for the fact that Mary Heath, whose two brothers were victims of the devil bat, and a newspaper reporter, John Layton, claimed to have seen this amazing creature? Sometimes, in the stress of excitement, our minds play tricks on us. Hey, he's insinuating you saw the little bat that wasn't there. Pipe down. But how about the picture of the devil bat published by Mr. Layton's paper? I examined that picture under a powerful magnifying glass. I denounce it as a fraud. Whoever constructed the strange-looking monster forgot to remove a label from the silk, from the silk used on its left wing. That label reads, Made in Japan. Put through a hurry call to Heathville. I want to talk to Johnny Layton. He's at the Heathville Hotel. One guess who that is. Yeah, McGinty. Go ahead, pour it on. So you slipped over a fake picture on me, huh? Well, you're fired, both of you. And I'll see to it that you never work on another newspaper as long as I live. Made in Japan. You tell one shot McGuire he ought to be snapping photos in a booby hatch. Both of you, come on in and get your final checks. Oh, no. We're not coming in to get anything. All right, so we're fired. But we're staying here just the same. I saw that bat. We're going to stay here till we catch that bat. And when we do, I'm going to bring it in and stuff it down your throat. Goodbye. Well, we're fired. Mm-hmm. Again. That's him calling back to apologize. Now, you give him a good scare. No use begging us to go to work for you again, McGetty. You fired us and we're staying fired. Oh, oh, Mary, I, I thought it was somebody else. Johnny, why did you make a joke of a tragic thing like this? But it wasn't intended as a joke, Mary. I was only trying to get the news. I suppose you call it getting the news when you arrange to print a picture. That's a deliberate hoax. That has the entire country laughing. A grand joke, Johnny but somehow I can't appreciate it. But I can explain that picture. Don't try, Johnny. Made in Japan. I ought to skin you alive and nail your hide to a barn door. Here's the chemistry part on that shaving lotion. I see he couldn't break down one of the ingredients. Yes, he said it must be some element with which he's not familiar. We won't get anywhere until we identify it. There's just one other man in this town that might be able to help us. Dr. Carruthers. Yeah, Carruthers could help us. I found out he compounded that lotion. Well, if you suspect Carruthers, you're barking up the wrong tree, Johnny. He's the last man in this town that would harm anyone. Why, everybody loves him. Maybe so. But here's something else I dug up. The Heath and Morton fortunes are based on a greaseless cold cream formula Dr. Crothers invented. So what? All the doctor got out of it was $10,000, and the others made a fortune. Well, it's common knowledge that he sold out for cash when he could have had an interest in the firm. Just the same, every victim had this stuff from his laboratory on him. Maybe you've been working too hard on this case, Johnny. Well, I'd just like to get his reaction on the stuff. 
If he denies knowing anything about it, we'll know there's a tie-up somewhere. I think you're bombing. But just to show you that I'm following up every clue, we'll talk to him. We'll uh, put this in another bottle, and without telling him we know he compounded it, ask him to analyze it. Doc, I hope we're not upsetting your work, barging in on you this way. No, no, not at all. I'm anxious to help solve these crimes. All the victims were very dear friends of mine. Here's a sample of the stuff young Morton and the two Heath boys had on them when they were attacked by the devil bat. Of course, it doesn't make sense to me that a bird would choose only people using that particular stuff. A bat is not a bird. It's a mammal. Well, anyway, our police chemist couldn't break down one of the ingredients. We thought perhaps you could. Why? I compounded this myself. It's a new shaving lotion I'm experimenting with. The ingredient your chemist couldn't break down, I discovered years ago in Tibet. How did you happen to put it in a shaving lotion? Oh, the lamas use it in some of their religious rites as a perfume. The scent is very pleasant and can't be imitated by competitors. But what were Don Morton and the two Heath boys doing with the stuff? Oh, it is the policy of our firm to try out any new product before marketing it. Well, that knocks our theory into a cocked hat. Yeah. We were hoping the unknown ingredient might turn out to be some sort of a clue. This isn't the kind of bottle I give it out in. But I presume your chemist changed it when making the analysis. Yeah. Is there anything else I can do to help? Tell me, did you hear Professor Raines on the radio last night? Yes. It was very interesting and very asinine. You mean you believe there is a devil bat? Why not? You saw it, didn't you? Well, sure I did. So did Mary. Then why worry about what one scientist says? That uh, one scientist got me fired. Oh. You mean uh, your newspaper discharged you? That's right. Oh, that's too bad. Then you're believing Heathsville before the mystery is solved. I'm afraid not. I'm going to stay here and work with the chief. Since you're going to stay here for a while, I would like you to try out a bottle of the new lotion and tell me how you like it. And you too, Chief. No, no, not me, Doc. If my wife ever smelled perfume on me, she'd suspect me, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Layton, I understand you are not married. All right, I'll try it in the morning when I shave. I guess we'd better be going, Chief. See you later, Doc. So long, Dr. Crothers. Goodbye, Mr. Layton. What's the matter? What's the matter? Does that uh, smelly shaving lotion put you to sleep? Oh, well, why'd you tell the doc you're gonna use it if you think it's smelly? Oh, I don't know. I uh, guess I was a little ashamed of ever suspecting the old duck. Well, I like it, and I'm gonna tell him so. Uh, what time is it? <sighs> After midnight. Midnight? Oh, there ain't no use of waiting around here any longer. This must be the bat's night off. <laughs> Yeah. Get that camera ready. You got him. Listen, Johnny, I'm gonna cook that bird personally for McGinney, and I'll even stuff it myself. <laughs>
still skeptical when I came to Heathville today to examine the body of this so-called devil bat. But after seeing it personally and making exhaustive research, I've arrived at the conclusion that the creature is the lone survivor of a type of giant bat which existed in great numbers during the early part of the Neolithic age. Perhaps I should explain for the benefit of some of our listeners that the Neolithic age is that period of antiquity commonly called the Stone Age. <laughs> Imbecile, bombastic ignoramus. but uh, one shot and I are not interested, at your prices. Of course, if there was a raise of, say, twi uh, 30. 30 dollars plus a fat bonus, we uh, might consider it. You're hold up, men, both of you. I refuse to be robbed. Have it your way, McGinty, have it your way, but uh, we have the bat's corpus delecti and the exclusive picture. Of course, I've got an eyewitness story that two syndicates are bidding for. And don't forget, you gotta pay us for the time we were fired. That's better. Now you're talking, boss. Okay, we're working for you again. We'll gather up the loose ends and see you in a couple of days. Goodbye. <laughs> Come in. Hello, Johnny. Well, Mary. Johnny, I came to tell you that I'm sorry I said what I did the last time we talked. Do you suppose... <laughs> well, I don't know how to say it, but... I do. Uh, uh, Miss Heath, uh, do you suppose that little French girl would apologize to me if I looked her up? Positive she would. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello there. <laughs> oh, oh dear. Well, at least these bats are more realistic than the ones in the movie. Okay, maybe not. Anyway, uh, I can't figure anything out. I've tried every antidote I have, and I can't do anything about this. So let's go to bombastic monster hunter, Dr. Von Bulo. Maybe he can shed some light on the subject. Happy birthday. <laughs> today, kids? Hmm, strange, strange thing. I think we're gonna learn about bats. That's right, you saw it here. The bat, a terrifying creature of the night, swarming into your home. Look at his fangs, look at his horrible features. Oh, he's going to digest you. So, today we're going to learn about how to get rid of bats, evil bats. You know what? Despite what you see on TV, bats hate perfume. They hate it! I'll prove it to you right now. Here is a bat. Here is some Eau de Vavois number seven. I use it all the time. Now, witness. For those of you who are members of PETA, no bats were harmed in the filming of this creature corner. Much. Oh, it's pointed at me! You see? They hate it. So that's another creature corner for you kids. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. And I've got a hot take. There we go. All right. See you later. Yes. 
are attracted to Garou's moonlight stench, yet when they are sprayed with the substance itself, they cannot endure its foul odor. A paradox. <laughs> A most ingenious <laughs> paradox. <laughs> One more. Now, let's get back to the devil bat, now that we've solved this little problem here. And uh, when you come back, you're going to watch a wonderful interview with Jason Mayo, who wrote a great comic book. Stay tuned for that. Don't go away. <laughs> Good job, Guru. Happy birthday. <laughs> Splendid. You will be even greater than your unfortunate predecessor. <coughs> enraged, aren't you? Fine. I'm enraged also. Tonight I shall call on Henry Morton. And you shall strike him down. Henry, the lotion has turned out to be better than I had hoped. I want you to try it. Well, well, just leave it here, Doc, and then I'll try it in the morning after shaving. It smells good, doesn't it? Yes, but isn't it too strong? No, no, no. Evaporation quickly tones it down just to the right scent. Rub a few drops on your face. Well, I'd rather wait until after I shave. Then my skin will be more tender and receptive to a lotion. Uh, well, uh, just a little here. The texture of the skin there is always very delicate. I give you a few, few drops in your hand. I hope you're right about that scent evaporating quickly. I smell the high heavens. Perhaps that will be the secret of its success. Well, you can never tell what's going to happen in this business. You can believe me, Henry. You don't have to worry. Yes, I can believe that, Doc. All of your formulas have been highly successful. Oh, I've been going over the report of the company's annual earnings. A net profit of over a million dollars. Not bad, eh? When you remember what we built on. A mere $10,000 for your formula. You shouldn't have demanded all cash, Doc. You should have ridden along with us. Then you'd be rich, too. Now, well, then, you've had a lot of fun in your laboratory, with your experiments, dreaming up something new. You're a dreamer, Doc. Too much money is bad for dreamers. So you try to pay me in flattery, telling me that I'm a dreamer. Well, I do dream. Dreams that you could never guess. Well, your nerves are frayed, Doc. Now calm down. Get a grip on yourself. You've been working too hard on your formula. Formula. That's but child's play for a great scientist. 
Your brain is too feeble to conceive what I have accomplished in the realm of science. Doc, you've made some great scientific discovery. What is it? Then you'll find out, Henry, it'll be too late for you. Oh, come, come, Doc. You can't pretend to control a man's destiny. I've already proved it three times. Perhaps you're right, Henry, about my working too hard. I guess I'm a little tired. I better go home and get some rest. Sure. A night's sleep will do you good. Good night, Doc. Goodbye, Henry. Thirty-six J. Hello. Oh, that's you, Martin. Yes, Henry. I want you to call Chief of Police Wilkins to come to your house immediately. It's very important. Chief's here now. Well, don't let him leave until I get there. What did I happen? I think I've got a clue to all those murders. It may peter out, but if half what I suspect is true, it's the most diabolical plot that a madman ever concocted. Talk about the absent-minded professor. I forgot my hat. Henry, what is it? I'll tell you all about it when I get there. I hope I didn't intrude on a private conversation. <laughs> no, there's nothing important. I hope Henry was right about having a clue. But why didn't he explain more about it when he phoned? When I insisted, he changed his tone as if he'd been interrupted. I was afraid that he might be overheard. What is that squeaky sound? Oh, just some night noise. Much better, Mr. Heath, since you ask us to stay in your home until this new devil bat has been killed. I've been worried about Mary. What reason have you to believe that Mary is in danger? Only this. 
I'm convinced that someone is using the bat to wipe out the entire Heath and Morton families. As a scientist, I assure you, the thought of a human controlling a bat is fantastic. Just the same, no villager has been killed or even attacked. You're forgetting, aren't you, that Mr. McGuire was attacked. He's not a member of either family. Why, I'm practically a member of this family already. I'm going to marry Miss Heath's maid. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Well, boys, I'll have Maxine show you to your rooms. Thank I must you. be running along home. It's past my bedtime. Good night, gentlemen. Good night, Good night Martin. Good night, Doctor. Good night, Doctor. Goodbye, Mary. Come along. Maxine? Oui, mademoiselle. Did you fill my perfume bottles with something new? Oh, no, mademoiselle. I never touch your perfume. It's funny. I don't recognize it. Perhaps Dad filled them as a surprise. He always does that with every new perfume the plant puts out. Is there anything else? No, Maxine, that's all. Good night. Good night, mademoiselle. trying to get in the window. A big bat. Oh, it was awful. Mary, I want you to tell me everything you did just before that bat tried to get in. Well, first I took a bath. Then I brushed my hair, and Maxine came in and turned the covers down. And then fastened the screen, which somehow had come unhooked. Yeah? Go ahead, what else? Well, uh, then we talked about some new perfume that someone had put in my dressing table bottles. Dad, did you put any new perfume in my bottles? No, I didn't. Is this the stuff? Yes. Tony, this smells like... Dave, quiet. I've got a hunch that I want to follow up, and I'll need everybody's cooperation. We'll do everything we can. Of course. What's Carruthers' number? 48J. Operator, give me 48J, please. Hello, Dr. Carruthers. This is Johnny Layton. That's right. Something terrible has happened to Mary. Can you hurry over? I'll be right there. Good. Oh, it's Johnny. I'm all right. I don't need a doctor. That's where the cooperation part comes in, Mary. You'll have to pretend to be a nervous wreck. Mr. Heath, you in one shot must help her trick Dr. Carruthers into staying here as long as you can. Where are you going, Johnny? To uh, do a little private bat hunting. Devil bat, try to get through that window. If she's suffering from fright, I give her a sedative. Where's Mr. Layton? Why, well, I guess he's out in the garden hunting the devil bat. Layton is a very brave young man. Give him heat, one of these, every half an hour. We, oui, Doctor. It will quieten her nerves. But, Doc, hadn't you better stay until she's quieter? She'll be all right in the morning. Oh. Hey, Doc, I don't feel so good myself. Would you mind taking my temperature? You look perfectly well, Mr. McGuire. Well, you ought to see my tongue. It looks just like a squirrel's tail. Look. Oh. Try some calomel.
may have visitors tonight. And it would be dangerous for me if they found you here. Hi, Doc. I hope I'm not intruding. No, no, not at all. I heard you were out stalking the devil back. Any success? No, but I uh, thought maybe you might be able to help me. Well, I don't see how that's possible, but, but if you can suggest anything... Well, you could give me some more of that new concoction of yours, that shaving lotion. But how on earth could that possibly help catch the devil back? I've still got a crazy idea that if I douse myself with it, it might attract the killer. I don't see how you can connect the two. But there is a bottle of the lotion on the table. Thanks. You see, Doc, I figured out something. All four of the murdered people had this lotion on them when the devil bat struck. Now, my plan is to sit in the garden, and when the killer makes one of those power dives, I'll blast him. Leighton, I'm afraid all these murders have affected your mind. Maybe you'd like to come along, Doc, and be an eyewitness. I'm sure it would be just a waste of time, but I'd be glad to watch your experiment. Good. I knew I could count on you to help me. I tell you, Leighton, expecting a bat to be attracted by the scent of a lotion is all foolishness. I think I better run around. Ah, sit down, Doc. The uh, devil bat's behind schedule tonight. You uh, aren't very chummy tonight. What's the matter? Uh, firearms always make me nervous. Oh. I thought maybe you didn't want to be sitting too close to me. Uh, just in case the devil bat does show up. According to your theory, the killer wouldn't attack me. I haven't any of that lotion on me. You have now, Doc. Why did you do that? To make it a 50-50 proposition, Doc. Now sit down. And don't try any shenanigans. Not so funny when it's your own juggler vein that's in danger. Is it, Doc? I... I don't know what you're talking about. Maybe you made a mistake when you let that devil bat of yours out of the attic tonight. Don't worry about the bat killing you. I'm saving you for the hangman. Tell me, Doc, how did you uh, develop a monster bat like that? You wouldn't understand the scientific theory.
Chief. What are you doing out here? Young fellow, don't think that you're the only man working on this case. And it was lucky I was here, too. Thanks. Did you kill the devil bat? No, he got away. Well, here's one bird that didn't get away, and he's the murderer we've both been looking for. <coughs> Quick, shoot it! <coughs> <coughs> Where is it? It's gone. And so's the doctor. Did you get the bat? What happened? Doc Carruthers is the murderer. And he's hiding somewhere in the garden. You fellas get back to the house and guard Mary. Come on. Doctor! Dr. Carruthers! Doctor! Has anything happened to Johnny? Is he hurt? They took him up to my place. You better come along with me. Carruthers, he's over there. That devil bat belonged to the doctor, Mary. He created it to commit those murders. Well, it's too late to help the doc. I hope you enjoy the terror that you beheld. And uh, I got something really special for you here. I'm here with Jay Mayo, who wrote this comic. It's called Tales of Rocky Point Park. This is really cool stuff. And he's with his pal here. How's it going, Jay? Good, good. Thank you so much for uh, welcoming me to your Attic of Doom. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for daring to, to come into my domain here. And I wanted to talk to you about your comic book and uh, to let our dreary ones know about it. It's really wonderful stuff. Uh, now, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I've um, been drawing all my life and I've been to horror movies and comics all my life and just wanted to put out a first project um, and it just happened to be Rocky Point, which I used to go to as a kid numerous times. Right, I've been there many times myself and it's sad that it's closed out. Now, is that why you chose Rocky Point as a subject? Because of childhood memories of it? Well, I, I, you know, it's funny, I hadn't even thought about it in years, about 10 years, and uh, my friend who owns a store in Cranston suggested, let's do a comic book about Rocky Point. Um, I started looking up pictures of it, and I couldn't believe what it had sort of decayed into. Right. And um, actually went back there, and just to be on the site, it was definitely a surreal setting. Yes, it's definitely, it's a, like, like I said, we, you did uh, Carnival of Souls, you went there. It was a place where fun went to die. It was, it was just silent. It was, it was you, so you did the artwork in this, mm -hmm. and you also wrote the story as well, right. which is a sort of a spooky sort of story. It focuses on my favorite place in Rocky Point, the House of Horrors. Now, why did you select that particular ride to, to talk about? Well, um, after it closed down, that ride seemed to take on a life of its own after Rocky Point was closed. And it was one of the last structures standing, and uh, I had heard so many creepy rumors about it that it was definitely the, uh, the subject for a good horror story. It definitely was. I remember, I remember it well. And uh, the, now, what's the, the story with the Viking here? Now, he was part of this whole thing. Well, the Viking was weird. It was, um, the House of Horrors was actually designed by uh, Dark Ride engineer Bill Tracy, and in none of his catalogs was a Viking character. So people aren't really sure where it came from. Uh, one of the strange things about it is it was first located inside the House of Horrors, and then for some strange reason, years later, they moved it to the front of the House of Horrors. And um, if you look back at pictures, you'll see it it's sort of in different positions at certain points, and there was actually a rumor about a kid getting scalped on the House of Horrors run, huh. due to the Viking. Wow, geez, you, you have a temper, don't you? Now, uh, 
Now, can we expect further installments of Tales of Rocky Point Park? I hope so. I think so. I mean, uh, it's gotten a really good response, and I'd like to do more stories on some of the other different rides that were there and uh, keep sort of a, a horror Twilight Zone twist to them. Wonderful. Yes, this definitely is a great comic book. I highly recommend it. And um, everybody who's read it so far, who I've talked to, really has loved it. You did a really wonderful job with this. And uh, locally, uh, Rocky Point is a legendary attraction that everyone used to used to go to around mm -hmm. here. And uh, people are sort of reliving the memories. I remember, I'm looking at this, and I see these places I recognize. And I, like, I haven't seen these places in such a long time. So it's really cool to see this, and with a great story and great artwork. Uh, so wonderful. I'm glad to hear that you're going to be doing more of these. Well, thank you so much for contributing, too. And uh, there's also a section in the back where Penny and um, some other local horror notable persons have contributed their own memories of Rocky Point. Yes, it was, uh, it was my memory of the snake lady, the reptile from Hammer's The, the Reptile. That, that lady used to freak me out. Of when course. I was I wanted to give you this while I was here. Oh, oh dear. Just so you can oh. keep her under your pillow at night. Oh, you're so sweet. Isn't that sweet? What a nice guy. Look at that. He gave me a monster world with the snake lady on it. I'll have terrible, terrifying nightmares now. What a guy. Thanks. I also wanted uh, you to have this uh, House of Park shirt. Oh, thank Look, he comes bearing gifts. Isn't that sweet? Thank you. Look at that. That's cool. Now, you can, you can get this shirt too, right? On the internet. I think you can find it if you're a crafty enough typer. Right, look at look it up Tales of Rocky Point Park on your favorite search. And this is cool, look at it, it has all the, the monsters there and the House of Horrors. I love it. Thank you very much, Jay. Okay, it's yeah, very welcome, sweet of you. Look at this. And I do have one last item, um, but I must warn you, it is a piece of the House of Horrors uh, taken directly from Warwick, Rhode Island at Rocky Point. People that have stolen items or taken them um, have been known to uh, befall the wrath of the Viking. Uh oh. Well, uh, I think it's worth it to have a piece of Rocky Point here. Thank you so much, oh, you're Jay. Well, he's getting he's getting a little riled up. As you can see the little vein in his temple is throbbing there. So thank you very much, Jason. I love. Uh, uh, I'll got you. You can visit it. I have need mm. that you can have when you come visit me. It's all right. And. Uh, Thank you very much. Now, how can we find this this wonderful comic book that you've written? It should be available on newsstands in local comic stores and antique stores, and also in all Benny's stores in Rhode Island. Excellent. And at the time capsule, too, isn't that? That's right. Place in Cranston, Rhode Island. In Cranston. Is there like an email address you can write to if you want to find out more about um, it? You can. It's. Uh, I'll give you my email address. It's mayoj at yahoo.com. It's m-a-y-o-h-j at yahoo.com. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Jay. Thank you so much for having me on. It was a pleasure having you in my attic. Thank you, sir, very much. The strength there really crushed my, my little witchy hand here. And I'm going to just be wearing this when, when Guru gets gets back to the attic. He's going to be really jealous. But I got a Rocky Port shirt, Snake Lady car, uh, magazine, and a piece of the park. Ha <laughs> ha. You don't have this, Guru of Mambulo, but I do. Have a most excellent evening. <laughs>